Okay, so uh, I'm looking today at two uh, so-called epistolary novels. As I say, uh, epistolary means letter to do with letters, based on letters. And uh, they are both written by women. We've got Afro Ben that we mentioned before when we were talking about the 17th century. We've got a 17th century writer here. And we've got uh, Fanny Burney, uh, an 18th century writer. And uh, the idea of making a novel out of letters developed really in Spanish first and, and moved into French literature. And its main period of popularity was during the uh, yes, late 17th and, well, up to the late 18th century. Uh, it went into a kind of decline as a genre then, but it, it's been revived by various writers at various times. So, as I say, people even today write novels which are either completely or usually partly, at least, epistolary. That is based on letters. And we, we also extend the term to include things like diaries, um, other kinds of paper records, that pe and, and putting those records together to make a kind of narrative. Uh, and the first true epistolary novel in English was written by a woman. We're seeing, you know, a number of li um, milestones, really, uh, by women, uh, almost unnoticed in our normal history of English literature. The first autobiography was written by a woman, if you remember, back in the Middle Ages. Um, the first uh, epistolary novel was written by a woman here, uh, in the 18th, sorry, in the 17th century. So, then later on, in the later part of the 18th century, we get Fanny Burney's novel, Evelina, which was um, very famous. It's, it's one of the very few epistolary novels from the, that people still actually read. And at the time, it was, you know, it was a big success at the time. It was a popular, a popular work. So uh, I'm going to look at those two, uh, both written by women. One, at, you know, kind of right at the beginning of the genre as it got started in England and the other one sort of towards the end of its its first phase as I say it got uh, and it brought back to life a little bit and you'll, you'll you probably remember letters in a number of novels um, Jane Austen for example uses letters in some of her novels uh, but it's just a part of the novel so it's partly a pistolary okay so uh, I think the first one, I've always found the 17th century kind of particularly interesting and, and surprising as well because you get all kinds of taboos being challenged in, in the 17th century. Uh, the 18th century seems to be a more careful time. People are kind of more worried about little nuances of manner and uh, sort of satire and things like that. So I, I um, will spend a, a reasonable amount of time on this uh, I think, a very unusual piece of writing by Afro Ben. Basically, you've got uh, a young man called Philander. Uh, Philander is often used in modern English to mean uh, somebody who plays around with women. You know, somebody who, a philanderer is somebody who, yeah, he, he flirts with women, he, he, he gets into bed with a, a whole range of different women. He, he, he's not a loyal sort of, uh, man, um, I'm going to have to turn that off really just to get you to see the screen clearly. Uh, so um, it has both meanings really. I think in this story, he's uh, he, firstly he's married to a woman that he doesn't love. In fact, uh, even more than not loving the woman that he's married to, he actually loves another woman, and that woman is the sister of his wife. All right, now um, she. She, at the beginning of the novel, has uh, prohibited him from going near her. She says, you've got to keep away from me. 
but he can't hold back. He can't restrain himself. He's absolutely, he's head over heels in love, and uh, he just can't obey her instruction to keep away from, from her. So he writes a letter to her, uh, begging her to allow their love to grow. So you've got to start off with this um, Philander, who, you know, he's, he's completely besotted with, with his Sylvia. That's the starting point of the novel. And so we're going to move into the first letter, which today he would write in this sort of format, but we don't suppose he did it quite like that at that time. But uh, so just to make it... Uh, Though I parted from you, I'm going to go through the whole thing. Though I parted from you, resolved to obey your impossible commands, yet no, oh charming Sylvia, that after a thousand conflicts between love and honour, I found the god, love, too mighty for the idol, honour. I found the god lay reign absolute monarch in my soul and soon banished that tyrant thence. I, I, I have to follow my heart, not... That, that cruel counsellor that would suggest to you a thousand fond arguments to hinder my noble pursuit. Sylvia came in view. Her ir irresistible idea, with all the charms of blooming youth, with all the attractions of heavenly beauty. Okay, you can't stop thinking about her. Loose, wanton, gay, he calls her, all flowing bright hair and languishing her lovely eyes. This is how he thinks about her. Her dress all negligent as when I saw her last discovering a thousand ravishing graces, round white small breasts, delicate neck and rising bosom, heaved with sighs, she would in vain conceal, trying to pretend that she's not sighing, and all besides that nicest fancy can imagine surprising, oh, I dare not think on, lest my desires grow mad, and raving, let it suffice, oh, adorable <coughs> Sylvia. Okay, so uh, there you go. I mean, there's passion for you. OK, so uh, he, he can't stop thinking about her. He has to write to her, um, even though his love goes against his honour. The honourable thing to do is, you know, he's married to her sister. So uh, the honourable thing to do is to put his honour first. That, that's what this bit about is, is, is about at the beginning here. So uh, he then goes into this very, very sensual description of her, uh, with her heaving breasts and everything. And... Um, and says he has to write to her. He can't, he can't keep away from her. Okay. I think and know enough to justify that flame in me which our weak alliance of brother and sister has rendered so criminal. We're not supposed to hear you're my sister-in-law. Okay. But he that adores Sylvia should do it at an uncommon rate. It is not enough to sacrifice a single heart to give you a simple passion. Your beauty should, like itself, produce wondrous effects. It should force all obligations, all laws, all, all ties, even of nature's self. You, my lovely maid, were not born to be obtained by the dull methods of ordinary loving, and tis in vain to prescribe me measures, and oh, much more in vain, to urge the nearness of our relation. I don't care that we're technically brother and sister. You know, what, what's that got to do with anything? All right? Uh, we're not blood relations anyway. So uh, what kin, my charming Sylvia, are you to me? No ties of blood forbid my passion. And what's a ceremony imposed on man by custom, the wedding? What's that? What is it to my divine Sylvia that the priest took my hand and gave it to your sister? What alliance can that create? Why should a trick devised by the wary old only to make provision for posterity tie me to an eternal slavery? It's just a, a useless convention. It's just an empty thing. It doesn't really mean anything. I mean, some old man stood up and said some words of blah, 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 I'll pronounce you man and wife you know what has that got to do with anything I, I love you all right I can, I can forget all this silly convention and people mumbling priests mumbling words in churches it's got nothing to do with what I feel in myself Is he, is he thinking about it? 
What's he going to say next? No, no, my charming maid. Tis nonsense all. Let us, born for mightier joys, scorn the dull, beaten road. But let us love like the first race of men. All right, in the Bible, of course, they, they had to, brother and sister had to marry in order to fill the world. Nearest allied to God, promiscuously they loved and possessed. Father and daughter, brother and sister met and reaped the joys of love without control and counted it religious coupling. And was encouraged to by heaven itself. Start, therefore, start not, don't be surprised, too nice and lovely made at shadows of things that can but frighten fools. Put me not off with these delays. Rather say you but dissemble love all this while than now tis born to die again with a poor fright of nonsense, a fit of honour, a phantom imaginary and no more. No, no, represent me to your soul more favourably. Think you see me languishing at your feet, breathing out my last in sighs and kind reproaches on the pitiless Sylvia. Pitiless because she won't let him talk to see, see her. Reflect when I am dead, which will be the more afflicting object, the ghost, as you are pleased to call it, of your murdered honour, or the pale and bleeding one of the lust. Philander. Which would you rather see lying dead and bleeding at your feet? Me or your honour? Okay? Forget honour. All right? Put love before honour, basically is what he's saying here, and I love you, and we've got a, a passion here that, that can't be um, limited in that sort of way. So, uh, you know, that, that would be the, the kind of gist of what he's saying. We will go through an interpretation of this, okay? So, um, just uh, bear with me for a minute. So, he sends off his letter, without a subject. Off it goes, and he sits and waits, imagining what his uh, beloved... Uh, Sylvia is going to say in response, will she, will she reply, what, what will happen? Well, before we move on to that, let's just slow down and take a look at what we've read. There are several points of interest. Now, the first thing is that after a thousand conflicts between love and honour, Philander chooses the god, that is, he chooses love, rather than the tyrannic idol, that is, honour. So he chooses love over honour. Well, according to the social code of the time, your love should never bring dishonour. Either to the man or to his lover, it should, it should be, love should be an honourable thing. So you should put honour above all things. So a dishonourable uh, relationship should be broken off. So that challenges the, uh, the, the mores of the 17th century. And then in that second paragraph where he's describing his lover as loose and wanton, and loose and wanton both suggest sexual immorality. A loose woman, a wanton woman, it suggests a prostitute. It suggests a, a loose woman is in fact another word for a prostitute. A wanton uh, means uh, is somebody who, who gives their sexual favours you know, here and there. All right. So uh, he describes her as loose and wanton. Um, but he's using them as terms of praise. He sees them as, you know, you're so free rather than as, as a sort of negative moral judgment. So they're terms of praise, not of censure. And uh, then uh, you get this incredibly, unabashedly sensual uh, description of her ravishing graces, her, her round, white, small breasts, delicate neck, and rising bosom heaved with sighs. Okay, it's very, very, very physical. Okay, and, and uh, no sort of sense of... Um, Oh dear, is this appropriate? Should I? You, you wouldn't. You wouldn't really get this in. Like you'd never get anything like this in Jane Austen or even in the Brontes. Okay, or really, uh, by the time you get into the middle of the 18th century, writing like this is kind of, well, by by the by the by the middle of the 18th century, you've already got uh, pornography as a genre, and this would be kind of in that area. It wouldn't be part of uh, uh, normal discourse. Uh, Philander then goes on to speak of their weak alliance of brother and sister, noting that no ties of blood forbid my passion. So he makes light of the fact that he's married to Sylvia's sister. What alliance can that create? What's that got to do with anything? Okay, so uh, he's 
challenging the taboo against putting love before honor. He, he's challenging the taboo of sort of a, the giving very uh, sensual physical descriptions and uh, his moral judgment is the opposite to what we'd expect of a loose and wanton woman uh, in terms of the 17th century way of thinking about things. And uh, finally, he challenges the incest taboo, um, at first saying, you know, we're not brother and sister. But then, he goes on to break, even, you know, just to say, even if there were ties of blood, so what? All right. Now, uh, marriages were supposed to be according to the will of God. So that's going, you know, even even in modern kind of Christian thinking, uh, you know, they twain in the Bible, they those two, they twain, those two shall be one flesh. So then uh, they are no more twain. They're not two anymore. They're one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder, uh, let not man separate. So if God's put it together, men should not separate it. Uh, marriage is the joining together of two people uh, in the sight of God. It's, it's, it's a very strong social bonding um, force. So it still is. Uh, not not, not as, it, as strongly as it was in the 17th century, but uh, it's still uh, quite a powerful thing. So again, breaking a fundamental taboo of, his, of, the, of the society. <coughs> And then actually going to the Bible to get justification for it. And that's, that's being really cheeky now, isn't it? Go, actually going to the Bible and saying, look, you know, uh, our love isn't actually incestuous in the sense that, you know, we don't share blood. But even if we did, look at what happened after Adam created Eve. There were only two humans, right? So how did they make any more? How did humanity grow according to the Bible? Those two humans had children. Those children had to sleep together and have sex together in order to, to populate the world. And then after that, uh, God goes and destroys the world again through a flood. And Noah and his wife are the only two people left. And they have to do the same thing all over again. So in the early parts of the Bible, that's just normal. Okay? Um, uh, they're... Uh, after creating Adam and Eve, their children and grandchildren were encouraged by heaven itself uh, to lie together as father and daughter, brother and sister, as uh, Philander puts it, in order to populate the world. So, uh, kind of cheekily going to the Bible and saying, look, you see, it's all right. It happened in the Bible, so it's all right. Uh, well, you know, the... The conventional explanation would be that God made a special allowance at that time, a special allowance in those particular circumstances, but that once the world was peopled uh, and populated, uh, the, the laws against sleeping with family members were absolute, so that the laws uh, changed. God, God gave a new law uh, later on, once the world had a, a reasonable number of people in it. That's the, uh, that's, the, that's the way it's supposed to be, according to, if you're going to look at it strictly from the point of view of the Bible. So he defies religious principles, he defies so social conventions, he defies moral principles. None of that matters. What matters is his passion for Sylvia. Quite radical stuff, I mean, very radical stuff. Philander also tells Sylvia that she should be won by a love so strong it can force all obligations, all laws, all ties, even of nature's self, concluding she was not born to be obtained by the dull methods of ordinary loving. So uh, th there is no limit. No laws should limit their love. And... Uh, yeah, it's very striking that the novel begins and can continues, too, with this idea of love as an all-consuming passion, something that overrides all other considerations. It reigns supreme. So, uh, quite an unusual, in fact, a, a highly radical opening to, to this uh, first true epistolary novel in English.
it's a challenge to everything really that the early modern world stands for. This uncommon love, setting aside all conventions, uh, the, the emphasis on the physical beauty of the woman with her, you know, her breasts and her, her small neck and her size and everything, uh, and her uh, sexuality. She knows no, you know, she is wanton, she is loose. And the whole picture from every which way you look at it is a challenge to the early modern world at, at almost every level. And it's written by a woman. Okay, and that's what really, I mean, that, that's the clincher, really. I mean, it's not a man that's writing it. Just as we saw, uh, you, you know, with um, the uh, uh, Urania, um, Countess of Montgomery's uh, Urania, uh, we, we had um, Mary Roth. Uh, uh, we, we had, uh, again, a, a, an incredible challenge to uh, normal no, what, what, what was accepted at the time as normal discourse. And so what, what's the message that she's communicating you know, to her readers here? What's, what's she actually doing with this? Where's she going with this? Um, is she saying that this is how a woman wants to be loved? All right. With, I mean, after all, I think most of male or female, if you've got anybody writing a letter like that to you, you think, wow. <laughs> Okay, uh, it, it's uh, it's obviously powerful, isn't it? Uh, it's just saying, you know, that's how women want to be treated. Uh, it's possible. I'm not sure about that. Um, actually, you know, obviously, that you know, this letter it is followed by another one and another one, and the story goes on. You know, it's a long story. It's worth taking a little bit of a look at where it goes. Uh, she talks about, with what regret I made you promise to prefer my honour before your love. Uh, she, uh, she's saying, you know, I'm sorry, I, I also feel terrible about what I said, you know, that I said put, put honour before love. Uh, I feel bad about that too, all right? So she, she's prepared to join him in setting aside honour. She's saying she regrets uh, making him promise to put honour first. Um, so she joins him in saying, yes, let's go for it. Let's, let's, let's have this love between us. So uh, she's making it clear that she also loves Philander. And at the end of the first part, they get on a little boat and elope together to Holland. That, the the story is in three parts, and that's the end of the, the, the first part. They go off to Holland together. So... Uh, it seems, you know, that, that uh, th everything is working out well, but their love is not actually favoured. Their love is ill-starred. They, they meet uh, misfortune in various ways. Um, firstly, they're forced to separate. Circumstances mean they cannot stay together. There's all sorts of uh, major events going on in the world around them, and they can't stay together. And while they're separated, first Philander and then Sylvia uh, embark on affairs with other lovers. They both have a tremendous uh, passion. And when they're separated from the first choice of their desire, they find other lovers. And by the end of it, by the end of the third part, by the end of the book, uh, Sylvia is frankly a prostitute. Okay. So uh, now you've got to do you, the whole thing is a different story now, isn't it? You think, ah, right, that's where all that passion ended up, is it? Okay. Um, is is this basically is that what you know Afro Ben wanted to show that if you follow your passion in that way, you 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 you're going to end up going down a bad road, or? Uh, is it more like she's thinking, oh, God, my readers are going to be really scandalized. I've got, I'm going too far. Remember, these things were published bit by bit. Okay, so she would get reactions to the first part. Then she'd get reactions to the second part. So she could feed off the reactions to think about where she's going to take the story. Uh, she might, it, it, it might be that uh, she felt that it was going too far uh, and she couldn't allow them to succeed in their passion because her readers were, would, would be too hostile. And, and feel 
uh, that's challenging our society, that's challenging our conventions. So, so she, she, she makes them have a bad fate. Or it may be that that's where she started off, that's what she wanted to show from the very beginning. All right? We don't really know, at least I, I don't know. Um, but another aspect of all of this is that the, the whole story is at least partly based on an actual real-life love affair. Okay, just as the Urania was uh, taken off the market, was forced to uh, be uh, recalled by the publisher because it, it uh, was satirizing real people who complained, uh, the same thing uh, was going on in um, Afra Ben's story that she's satirizing uh, an English politician, Ford Gray, and his wife's sister, uh, Henrietta Berkeley, who did something very similar to what Philander and uh, Sylvia do in the novel. Um, Henrietta Berkeley was taken to court and she was told, you have injured your own reputation and prostituted, no, notice the word, prostituted both your body and your honor. And she was imprisoned, well, it was a sort of token imprisonment, but she was put in prison for three days. And then uh, when he went into, he was forced into exile, he was forced out of England at that time, and again went to Holland, and she went with him. Um, history doesn't really tell us what happened to them after that. We don't really know. So uh, the satire, in a sense, breaks down at that point. Uh, Afra Ben um, tell, tells the story of Philander and Sylvia kind of falling into a, um, a decadent situation where they have other lovers and she ends up as a prostitute. Uh, we don't know what happened to the real-life pair that, that she based the story on. Um, it's interesting, though, that Gray was um, not punished in any way. I mean, it, okay, three days in prison is not that big a deal, I suppose, but she was, you know, humiliated in court. She was told that she'd prostituted her body and her honor. Uh, she was shamed, and she was imprisoned, even if it was only for a short time. Whereas, although he was found guilty of conspiring to run off with her and leave his own wife, uh, no actual penalty was imposed on him. And uh, also in the novel, Philander pays no penalty for his loose behaviour. He just goes off and has other women. Uh, she has other men, and that lowers her and lowers her and lowers her because uh, she has to depend on those men economically. And that's forcing her, basically, into prostitution. So uh, also the political fortunes. Gray, uh, you know, he was quite a... a, a um, an influential and significant figure uh, politically, uh, and then he was forced into exile and so on. That loosely, Philander follows uh, Gray, and it may be uh, that what's happening here is that Ben is kind of saying, "Look, you know, if it's a man, he gets away with it. You know, he he uh, you know he can have his affairs. But if it's a woman, she gets dishonored. She she becomes a prostitute. She gets uh, she gets called." Um, dishonorable and uh, accused of being a prostitute. So it may be that she's commenting on that. All right. I, I think it's really quite difficult to know how readers at the time would have responded to, to what she wrote. Um, certainly would be an interesting research project for anybody in this class who wanted to take a look at it, okay, and look at the back, critical background in detail and uh, sort of study, that, study it. In, in general, the epistolary novel works like that. It, it, it uses various devices like letters that get lost, letters that don't get sent. You get letters falling into the wrong hands. So, so it, there's a sort of meta um, framework going on. Um, it's not just the content of the letters. It's the fact that this particular letter was never actually sent. It was never actually posted. No, it wasn't read by the person it was written to. Or this letter got destroyed. Or, uh, so um, there's a certain amount of humor coming into it in the way that that, uh, that happens. And... Uh, 
that's typical not just in Ben's work, but in other epistolary novels. I'd like just to pick out some of the, the key features that might be of interest to us at this stage of the epistolary novel. Basically three points that I'm going to, to pick out here. Firstly, because you've got people writing to people that they know, you know, intimately, and these letters are personal, they're, they're not just personal, but I mean in the everyday scheme of things, these letters would be private. Of course, they're fictional, but uh, corresponding letters in the real world would be private. Right? So you're getting an insight into people's private thoughts. You're seeing what people sort of secretly and privately say to each other. So it's a very good um, way of conveying uh, feelings and emotions and, and uh, all the nuances of that. Uh, it's very often satirical. As we can see, this one is based on a, a real couple and therefore uh, it satirizes a, a, a scandal that was going on at the time. And that's, again, something that you're going to find in, in a lot of epistolary novels, that uh, the person who's writing uh, is being seen by the reader in a different way from the way they think they are. They're being interpreted in various ways. And finally, um, it's obviously, it's really suited to tales of love and romance, and it very often, therefore, has a female protagonist. Even the epistolary novels that were written by men, okay, like Fielding's Pamela, um, they were, sorry, Richardson's Pamela, F Fielding wrote them, sorry, Fielding wrote a satirical uh, uh, response to Pamela called Shamala. Uh, these, these novels, uh, let's just take a look at the fa some of the famous ones. Um, Richardson's Pamela, which is parodied by Fielding in Shamala. We've got uh, Cla uh, Clarissa, also by Richardson. So these are male writers, okay, but um, they, they also wrote in that genre. We've got uh, Frances Brooke, um, a, a woman writer again, writing the history of Emily Montague. You can see from the titles that they're all focused on women. Uh, Fanny Burney's Evelina, which is uh, what we're going to look at next. And uh, Jane Austen herself wrote an epistolary novel, uh, but it wasn't actually published at the time. She wrote it uh, around about 1794, but it wasn't actually published until 1871. So um, it, didn't, it didn't get a readership at that time. And um, uh, finally, we, we, I say finally because I'm going to take a little break after this, um, although they, they, we haven't yet moved on to Evelina, um, so before that we'll take a little break. But finally, before we take that break, I'd just like to look at the question of anonymity. That Ben published those love letters anonymously. Her name is not on the title page. And anonymity continues to be a feature, of, uh, particularly of women's writing during this period. Uh, pseudonyms, that is, you know, not using your real name, or anonymity, that is, not putting any name at all, uh, were typical in the 18th and, and through into the 19th century. Basically, you know, one of the reasons was that writing wasn't considered suitable, and the family uh, would uh, disapprove and this would be the case, for example, of Fanny Burney and her uh, Evelina. The, the, um, the family was likely to disapprove. And, and the other uh, underlying reason for anonymity was that the people, the women who wrote their works, felt that, oh, they won't take me seriously because I'm a woman. If they don't know, or if they think I'm a man, then uh, they're more likely to take my work seriously rather than just dismiss it, oh, it's just women's writing. So in order to get taken seriously, women would pretend to be men, or they would simply leave the, any name off the uh, title page of their work. 
Okay. So I think we're going to take a, a short break here. Okay, so moving on then to uh, Fanny Burney, and uh, her, her, her name was Frances, but she's commonly known as Fanny, and um, her Evelina, or the history of a young lady's entrance into the world, which was um, anonymously published. Um, she was outed. She was identified publicly as the author. And she was very angry about it. Uh, um, a man called George Huddersfield, Hudders, sorry, Huddersford published a poem uh, revealing that she was actually the author. And uh, she didn't forgive him. Well, I'll come back to that question of anonymity because something similar happens in the, in the story itself where Evelina gets outed or identified against her will. And it's kind of interesting that that happens in the story and it actually happened uh, to the author in real life. But I'd like to focus here on the preface that she wrote to the text. It, it really is, it's like she's doing her best to come across as a man and to make the, the whole thing a masculine thing. It's almost like in order to be, um, I think, I don't know, we talked about the early modern period that in order to be a man, you had to be able to suffer like a woman. I think we talked about that aspect of things. But, but now you've got, in order to be um, a woman, you have to pretend, in order to express yourself as a woman, you have to pretend to be a man. You have to, to take things and, and do things on ma ma male terms. And so uh, I'd like to look at her preface. She starts it off by saying, in the Republic of Letters, there's no member of such inferior rank or is so much disdained by his brethren of the quill as the humble novelist. So uh, novelists get a bad press. They get um, considered, um, they looked down on. Nor is his fate less hard in the world at large since among the whole class of writers, not, perhaps not one can be named of which the votaries are more numerous but less respectable. Uh, there are plenty, plenty of novelists, uh, but they're not, not um, well, they're, they're looked down on, they're not considered respectable. But look at the words that she's using there. She's talking about the popularity of the novels as genre and that it leads to it being disrespected. But notice the way she uses the expression, his brethren of the quill. She's defining novelists uh, individually and collectively as men, isn't she? All right, if you look back at that, um, his brethren of the quill there. All right, um, so uh, the novelist is seen as a man. She didn't have to say it like that. I know, um, you know, in those days they often used um, the uh, pronoun um, he and, and uh, used the masculine form to include the female, but um, she goes on in the following paragraph to kind of build up on that and, and strengthen that idea that the novelist is a, it's a world of men. Um, she says, Yet, while in the annals of those few of our predecessors to whom this species of writing is undoubted, un indebted for being saved from contempt, so those uh, few uh, good writers who... who uh, rescue us from depravity, for, keep the novel as a sort of high-class genre, we can trace such names as, and look at the names she picks up, Rousseau, a man, Johnson, a man, Marivaux, a man, Fielding, a man, Richardson, a man, and Smollett, a man. Uh, and again says, no man need blush at staring from the same post, though many, nay most men, may sigh at finding themselves distanced. She's really <laughs> laying it on thick, isn't she? It's, it's all about men. And she's, she's writing the novel, but she's, she's not even letting the doubt enter into her reader's mind that she herself might be a woman. She's using the word man, 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 and giving examples of male writers. Uh, it's all very, very kind of uh, driven towards uh, a, 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 a man's world.
頑張って。OK。Uh, Evelina、um, owes a significant debt to another、uh, woman writer, Eliza Haywood, who wrote the history of Miss Betsy Thoughtless. Well, she doesn't mention Haywood, does she? She mentions Rousseau, she mentions Fielding, she mentions Richardson and Smollett, but she doesn't mention、uh, Eliza Haywood or any of the other female novelists、uh, who, who were writing similar novels at that time. Well, similar, I mean, novels in the same epistolary genre or indeed any other type of novel. She wants her work to be taken seriously and therefore she places it entirely in the context of male literature. All right, I think this is saying something about how、uh, a woman、uh, would feel approaching、uh, a task like this, entering a male domain, entering male territory. She actually enters、uh, by stealth, she doesn't identify herself as a woman, she, she enters secretly into that world. On the other hand, she presents a female protagonist.、Uh, to draw characters from nature, she says, though not from life, and to mark the manners of the times is the attempted plan of the following letters. For this purpose, a young female, educated in the most secluded retirement, makes at the age of 17 her first appearance upon the great and busy stage of life. It was called Coming Out. We talked about it last week. With a virtuous mind, a cultivated understanding, and a feeling heart, Her ignorance of the forms and inexperience in the manners of the world occasion all the little incidents which these volumes record and which form the natural progression of the life of a young woman of obscure birth but conspicuous beauty for the six months after her entrance into the world. Before she came out, she existed only really in the private sphere. She didn't exist in the public sphere. She, she would come out into the public sphere for a short period of time. And then、uh, she'd be married and she'd be taken off largely again into the private sphere.、Uh, she would be,、um, in other words, transferred from belonging to a, a father to belonging to a husband. Now, in the case of、um, Evelina, she doesn't have a father、uh, readily available, uh, uh, so her, her situation is more delicate and she's a little bit more at risk. And the whole story is about like. Predatory males who are ready to jump on her and grab her because she's loose. She's unpossessed. She doesn't belong to、um, a, a particular man. So she, she, need, she has to depend on men in order to、uh, have her social identity. So,、um, yeah, th- this theme of a young woman of obscure birth but conspicuous beauty is something that comes again and again in the 18th century novel. You may remember、uh, Charlotte Bronte reacting against it and saying, I want to write, I want my uh, heroine,、um, Jane Eyre, not to be beautiful. I want her to be just, you know, normal looking. But.、Uh, Uh, yeah, she, she more or less she had to be beautiful. She was obscure, she wasn't high class,、uh, but she attracted everybody because she was of unusual beauty.、Um, those kinds of、um, stories were very popular at the time.、Uh, it, it appeals to the female reader、um, who herself thinks, yes, I could be like that, I could be like Evelina, I could marry somebody above me. Um, every, all the, the, the image of the, the, the typical woman at the time, kind of dreaming of marrying somebody of a higher class. You get an awful lot of romantic, sentimental fiction, all based on、uh, lower class women ending up marrying their higher class、um, master, for example, if they're working in the house. Again, that's what happens to Jane, isn't it? Jane Eyre ends up marrying、uh, her, her master, Rochester.、Um, But, but by the time you get to Jane Eyre, she's, she's seeing darker sides of the story. She's,、uh, she's going into、uh, other kinds of implications. But you get an awful lot of romantic fiction, which is just based on、um, yeah, women marrying higher class men. It, it's, it sort of、um, excites the imagination of the female reader, and it also、uh, engages the male reader who, who can look down on lower class women as sort of legitimate. Uh, pray. They all, they all want to jump into bed with me.、Uh, so, reading novels about、uh, you know, high class men having kind of engaging with lower class women was kind of,、uh, it appealed 
It appealed to both male and female readers. Uh, so, from a, the point of view of a, a, a woman writer, and that would go from J Bernie to Jane Austen, and again to to to, uh, to, to, to Charlotte Bronte, really. Uh, the, the trick here was for them to portray a higher class woman who actually, sorry, a higher class man who actually behaves honorably. All right, you get the, the you know, the dishonorable um, higher class man who preys on lower class women, uh, but you, you, you need, uh, you know, the, the, the woman of lower rank has to be able to be honorably married, not just taken to bed by uh, the higher class man. So uh, he doesn't just use and lose her, uh, you know, it's Kai Suthi sort of idea. He takes her as his wife and that, 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 that's the, the sort of uh, focus for a lot of the women's fiction of that period. Uh, and you get that scenario going on again and again in, in romantic fiction during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So, uh, the, the famous ones being Jane Austen, Jane Austen being the most famous exponent, really, of that kind of writing. Um, now, you've got Afra Ben. Look, look at the things she was challenging society. She was challenging its, its assumptions uh, in terms of, especially, the, you know, the religious assumptions, because it's still, to an extent, it's still a religious age that uh, Afra Ben is writing in. So in the end, a lot of it comes down to uh, religion. But by the time you get to the later part of the 18th century, society itself has moved on a lot. And... Um, Religion doesn't really come into most of these uh, 18th and 19th century fictions. And uh, Fanny Burney would be you know, typical in that sense. She's satirizing the, the society, its manners, its, its code, or its ethical code, its mores. Um, she's, she's not really kind of dealing with those kind of deeper religious or philosophical questions. It's, it's about manners. Uh, and again, that's fairly typical of, of that period. The 18th century, uh, it's a time when the fiction focuses more on little details of social behavior, social niceties. It, it doesn't look at too much. It doesn't get too involved with the big moral questions. Uh, I suppose it's partly because you've got uh, a rising middle class, uh, you've got people coming to live in the, in the cities, um, you've got uh, uh, the question of what, what, what is going to get people socially accepted, how are we going to keep social cohesion, that's really the, the issue I think in the 18th century novel. And uh, I talked about the private sphere of a woman before she marries and how she comes out into the public sphere in order to find a husband. Uh, it's, it, one of the big topics that they talk about, especially when they're talking about women in the uh, 18th and 19th century novel, um, or indeed in, in other aspects of literature and culture at that time, the, the tension between the private sphere and the public sphere. And the more shy and retiring, the more Evelino sort of wants to be inside her private sphere, in her, her private world, uh, the more attention she attracts. There's a sort of paradox. But, uh, but um, part of her attractiveness comes from the fact that she's not pushing herself into the public sphere. She, she wants to be in the private sphere, but she has to walk through the streets. So you get things like... We went first to the pump room. Now, the pump room was where the actual um, ongseng, the, the, um, the actual hot spring was. Uh, we, we went first to the, uh, sorry, the, uh, wait a minute, the pump room is, is the, the hot, they go through the pump room to the actual bath. It's a sort of chamber before they go into the bath. So uh, here there are people and, and they're not, they're, you know, they, they, they don't strip off here. They, it's just, um, you know, it, uh, a sort of social public space. So it was full of company, and the moment we entered, I heard a murmuring of, that's she. Okay, she's somehow or other, against her will, she's become famous. And to my great confusion, I saw every eye turned towards me. 
I, I, I pulled my hat over my face, and by the assistance of Mrs. Selwyn, a woman who's accompanying her, I endeavoured to screen myself from observation. Okay, I, I was able to hide myself away. Nevertheless, I found I was so much the object of general attention that I entreated her to hasten away. But unfortunately, she'd entered into conversation very earnestly with a gentleman of her acquaintance who would not listen to me, but said that if I was tired of waiting, I might walk on to the milliner's uh, shop uh, with the Miss Watkins, two young ladies I'd seen at Mrs. Beaumont's, who were going thither. So she gets out of the pump room because she's attracting too much attention. She's going through the streets with two young ladies. I accepted the offer very readily, and away we went, but we're not gone three yards before we were followed by a party of young men. You see, the three young women unaccompanied by a man, they're nobody's property. And so they get the kind of uh, hunting instinct of the young men uh, comes into play. Uh, a, a party of young men who took very every possible opportunity of looking at us, and as they walked behind, talked aloud in a manner uh, at once unintelligible and absurd. Yes, cried one, tis certainly she. Mark but her blushing cheek. You see, she's become famous in uh, the city of Bath, without her knowing why or what, what's she done. The more she tries to be private, the more they want to seek her out. And then her eye, her downcast eye, okay, continuing the narrative, cried another. Oh, true, almost true, said a third. Every beauty is her own. But then, said the first, her mind. Now the difficulty is to find out the truth of that, for she will not say a word. She's timid, answered another. Mark but her timid air. Okay, and they're walking on trying to ignore these young men who are kind of pestering them. During this conversation, we walked on silent and quick, as we knew not to whom it was particularly addressed. I mean, she, she's actually not even aware that which, which of the three is they're talking about. Of course, they're talking about her. Uh, we were all equally ashamed and equally desirous to avoid such unaccountable observations. And what's going to save the situation? Come on. Okay, well, firstly, yes, as I said, it's the, the, the paradox of um, being private is uh, actually attracting more attention. And so the more she tries to be in the private sphere uh, and keep her own private world, the more she's um, being forced into a public sphere, the more attention she attracts. Um, how does she get saved from the situation? There's only one way of saving herself in this situation. She has to be rescued by a man. A woman has to depend on a man. That's the message we're getting. Uh, again and again, in this kind of fiction. So, a man of her acquaintance, somebody she knows, somebody she doesn't actually like very much, but thank God he comes along at that particular moment, from her point of view, uh, because he can sort of uh, assert himself um, as the, 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 the owner, as it were, of, um, of Evelina, and therefore uh, protect her from these young men whose attention she doesn't want to, to have to put up with. So, the narrative continues. Soon after, we were caught in a shower of rain. We hurried on, and these gentlemen, following us, offered their services in the most pressing manner, begging us to make use of their arms. And while I almost ran in order to avoid their impertinence, I was suddenly met by Sir Clement Willoughby. He's a rascal himself, but on this occasion... He, he saves her from uh, a, an even less desirable situation. We both started. Good God, he exclaimed. Miss Anvil. And then, regarding my tormentors with an air of displeasure, he earnestly inquired if anything had alarmed me. Is there a problem here? No, no, cried I, for I found no difficulty now to disengage myself from these youths, who, probably concluding from the commanding air of Sir Clement, that he had a right to protect me, quietly gave way to him and entirely quitted us. Okay, so it's the appearance of a man who asserts his ownership over the woman that saves her from the situation. Okay, underlying that is an assumption by 
the young men, by Sir Clement and by Evelina herself, that a woman ju can't just be. She has to belong. She has to belong to a man. All right. This was the this was the sort of ideal. Uh, this was the paradigm that every woman belongs to someone, and those who don't, well, they're prey. They're going to get hunted. Okay. They're going to find it difficult just to go out and walk in the streets. And this is this was a big part of you know how feminism developed in the twentieth century. In the second half of the twentieth century, it was women want to walk in the streets just as men do, without being hassled or harassed uh, or you know. Uh, that kind of assumption being made, all right? But this was the paradigm uh, of the 18th century and through into the 19th century. Uh, women had to be chaperoned by, uh, preferably by a man, sometimes by an older woman. Get three young ladies walking along by themselves and it's, it's going to be a problem, okay? You're going to get young men coming in and sort of uh, thinking that they can make free with those women. So you've got um, two things going on here. One is the idea that women belong to the private sphere, and that leads to a paradox, which is the idea that a woman can't be, uh, you know, just herself. She has to be under the control or protection of a man. And that, along with the question of women's education, uh, forms the core of feminist debate from the late 18th century on. The, the question of um, a woman's right to a free and independent existence together with the idea of um, a woman's right to education. They, those become the, the kind of two main prongs of uh, feminist debate. Although I say feminist debate, but please remember the word feminist itself wasn't being used until about 100 years later. Okay, uh, The word feminist ca comes in in the later part of the 19th century. It's not a word that in themselves they used at that time, but uh, so we're, we're kind of using that term retrospectively to talk about uh, what was going on at this time. So, some uh, critics and historians and commentators would say you shouldn't say feminist, you should say proto-feminist, okay, which is kind of like before feminism or be in early feminism, something like that. But since, as far as I can see, the issues are the same, uh, I'm just using the word feminist. I don't think it's, I don't think it makes sense to call it anything else. 